and any of these names come to my website actually and this is a fairly uh, extensive website on capnography and it deals with you know the physics the physiology the clinical applications in pretty much in all details and whenever you have a chance i would encourage you to to go into the website to learn about capnography now it is also a mobile version actually and if you actually uh, use the qr code it takes to the mobile version on the iphone or the android versions and it is and it is compatible in those versions too now pulse oximeter is an excellent monitor of hypoxia and we all use pulse oximeter unfortunately one limitation of pulse oximeter is it only tells you that the patient is hypoxic and but it does not tell you or give you any clue to identify the etiology of hypoxia this is where capnography comes into picture capnography can potentially help to identify situations that result in hop, uh, hypoxia therefore what happens is it gives you certain clues and you can use these clues to figure out what is wrong with the patient that is causing hypoxia so that you can take preventive actions within the 3 minutes before hypoxia produces irreversible damage and another important thing about capnography is it helps to actually prevent hypoxia because it is going to forewarn about clinical situations that could potentially result in hypoxia if you do not take corrective measures based on the capnography clues but one thing you have to remember here is pulse oximeter is a direct monitor that means it tells you whether the patient is hypoxic or patient is not hypoxic whereas capnography is not a direct monitor it is an indirect monitor what it means is in order to diagnose a clinical situation using capnography you have to understand capnography thoroughly so that you can make a corrective assessment and diagnosis of a situation of a clinical situation that could either leading to hypoxia or potentially can lead to hypoxia now look at this example this was the before the era of capnography they gave general anesthesia for a cesarean section and the patient would not wake up when they did the blood gases on the patient they found that the patient was oxygenating very well but the patient has got a pacvo2 of 246 and this is beyond the co2 narcosis value of 110 and therefore this patient is in probably co2 narcosis coma and this is because of a problem with the ventilator they were using that there was a malfunction of the ventilator and therefore it was not eliminating the co2 and once they changed the ventilator patient woke up this could not have happened if capnography was used because it could have immediately given a clue that the entitled co2 or was is going to be very high in this patient now these are the standard monitors of asi and which also includes capnography in their armamentarium and this probably capnography was introduced as a as a armamentarium of a minimum standards in probably in the mid 80s in united states and subsequently many other countries followed that but just to it's not worthy to know that holland was the first country in 1978 to make capnography as a standard of care during anesthesia now normally you measure co2 waveform or the co2 at the junction of the patient circuit here and the anesthesia circuit here because you are monitoring the co2 between these two circuits it can actually give you some idea about what is going on in the anesthesia circuit and what is going on on the on the patient circuit the only thing as i said is it is not a direct monitor it will not tell you right away what is wrong and that is where you have to use your knowledge of capnography to figure out uh, you know what is wrong in a clinical situation now just little bit of physics and 
Now, CO2 is a polyatomic gas and therefore it absorbs infrared technology or it absorbs infrared light. So there is a source of infrared there uh, uh, in, in the unit and the CO2 absorbs the infrared light. The balance infrared light is measured and you know how much you're giving, you know how much you're measuring and the difference between the two is quantitated into a CO2 waveform, which you see in your monitor on a regular basis. Now, what happens here is you have to remember the CO2 is a polyatomic gas and, and this actually absorbs the infrared light at 4.3 millimicrons. And that is the wavelength where the CO2 molecules absorb. What about nitrous oxide, water vapor, which are also being concomitantly administered during anesthesia because they are, they are also polyatomic gases. Yes, they do absorb CO2. I mean, I mean they do absorb the infrared light and I mean, the, the CO2 molecules absorb and the nitrous oxide absorbs and the water vapor absorbs too. Therefore, many monitors actually give an automatic correction for the error produced by nitrous oxide and water vapor. What about oxygen? Oxygen is not a polyatomic gas, therefore it does not absorb infrared light. And it uses, to measure oxygen, we use paramagnetic, because it's a paramagnetic gas, therefore we use technology suitable for it to measure oxygen. Now, although oxygen does not interfere with the absorption of infrared light, carbon dioxide molecules, nitrous oxide molecules, and oxygen molecules, they collide with each other. And therefore what happens is it is called as, a, uh, it produces an interference in the absorption spectra of the, of the CO2, of the infrared absorption. And therefore the monitor also gives correction for these collision, uh, I mean broadening effect. Now, what happens in our clinical use? In general, the clinical use the errors produced by these are minimum. And therefore we need not worry about the errors produced by these in a clinical practice. However, if you are doing a physiological experiment, you have to remember this, the interference of uh, nitrous oxide, interference of water vapor and the collisioning broadening effect. And you have to give corrections for your measurements. Now, there are two sensors in clinical practice which is a mainstream sensor where the CO2 is actually measured across the airway. That means the, the whole cuvette containing the sensor is within the patient airway at the junction of the endotracheal tube and the circuit. In a side stream sensor, the CO2 or the expired gases are drawn via a tube of six feet length into this monitor where the measurements are made. So there is a lag of CO2 measurements compared to the actual events uh, or the respiratory events in the patient. In clinical practice, the common technology is a side stream sensor. I think that is what you must be using mostly in your clinical practice, but many also use the mainstream sensor to measure CO2. Now, a little bit of physiology. I think once you understand the physiology of capnography, it is extremely easy, it becomes extremely easy for you to actually understand capnography and apply to the clinical uh, scenarios. When you breathe out and take a fresh breath of oxygen, and then you breathe out and start measuring CO2, this is how your CO2 waveform looks like. Initially, the CO2, there's no CO2 because it is dead space gases. Then the dead space gases are mixed by the alveolar gases. Therefore, there's elevation or increase in the CO2 concentration. And then there is the alveolar gases here, which is, which is the CO2 coming from the, all the alveoli. Then you take the next breath. And if the next breath does not contain CO2, then the CO2 concentration falls dramatically. So basically this is how your capnogram looks like. It has got an expiratory segment here, 
and it has got an inspiratory segment here. And the shape of the capnogram is similar or identical in all healthy adults. A deviation from this shape requires whether it is, I mean, requires evaluation to determine whether it is a physical, physiological, or a clinical aberration responsible for that difference in the shape of the capnogram. Now, earlier, this is way before, say, before 2000, many clinicians were using several nomenclature, you know, to say what is a CO2 waveform looks like, PQRS, ABCD, et cetera. But in the middle of 1995, we came up with a standard terminology because it, CO2 waveform resembles the classic physiological nitrogen curve the nomenclature should also reflect same. So this is the phase one, which is the dead space gases. And this is the phase two, which is the dead space gas mixing with the alveolar gases. And this is phase three from the alveolar gases. And this is the inspiration or the inspiratory segment. The angle between the phase two and three is called as the alpha angle. And the angle between the phase three and the descending limb is the beta angle. This alpha angle is about 110 degrees normally, whereas the beta angle is about 90 degrees. Now, I will explain to you shortly that the phase three is actually is a reflection of the ventilation perfusion mismatch in the lung. So alpha angle in essence is a reflection of the ventilation perfusion matching in the lung. Now, you can also plot CO2 against the volume. See, this is the CO2 against time. So there is an expiration and inspiration. But when you plot CO2 concentration against expired volume, there is no inspiratory limb because you're plotting CO2 concentration against one expired volume. The advantage of plotting the CO2 concentration against the expired volume is it will, it will help you to determine the effective alveolar ventilation, the physiological dead space, and the components of physiological dead space like the anatomical or the alveolar dead space. So in essence, a volume capnogram is can be used to determine the components of the tidal volume, namely the effective alveolar ventilation and the physiological dead space, which are very important in our clinical practice. Now, the maximum concentration of CO2 at the end of the breath is called as the end tidal CO2. The end tidal CO2 is slightly lower than the arterial CO2 because of the alveolar dead space. So in one way, we can say that the arterial to end tidal CO2 difference is a reflection of alveolar dead space. Occasionally, you can get a terminal upward blip at the end of the phase three, and this is called as phase four. And this is seen in morbidly or, or obese patients under anesthesia, and also it is seen in pregnant women. To understand why phase four occurs, I would recommend that you go to my website and look under, phys uh, under physiology and phase four, you will understand why phase four occurs in our, uh, in, in, in our clinical practice. Now, when you look at the ventilation of the lung, the bottom of the lung, is better ventilated than the top of the lung. That is the normal physiology. When you look at the perfusion, the bottom of the lung is better perfused than the top of the lung. So in other words, the lung is better perfused and ventilated at the bottom of the lung compared to the top of the lung. But there is one important difference. When you plot the slope of the increase in ventilation from top of the lung to the bottom of the lung, they do not follow a similar 
linear pathway. There is a difference between how they increase from top of the lung to the bottom of the lung. Because of this, the lung has got various VQ alveoli. That means various VQ ratios. That is which you always, uh, you know, you say zone one, zone two, zone three, etc. Now, the top of the lung has got alveoli where the ventilation is more related to perfusion. Whereas the bottom of the lung, the VQ ratio is lower because the perfusion is more compared to ventilation. Now, physiologically, whenever the ventilation perfusion of the lung is low or the ratio is low, they contain more CO2. When ventilation is more than the perfusion, they contain less CO2. This is a normal physiology. Now, when such a lung where the CO2 concentration is more at the bottom of the lung compared to the top of the lung, when it begins to expire, it gives you this classic shape of capnogram, which you see uh, in your clinical practice. Now, the point why I'm explaining all this is, when you look at this alveolar plateau, it is not simply a line. Capnogram is not simply a, just a CO2 waveform or, 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 a, or a line like this. Just by looking at the capnogram, you can know exactly what is happening within the lung, particularly in terms of ventilation perfusion ratio or the ventilation perfusion status of the lung. This is how I see capnography and this is how I want all of you to see capnography. Now, the height of the capnogram is dependent on two things, the ventilation and the perfusion because of the, as I said, alveolar plateau reflects the VQ status. So whenever the cardiac output decreases or increases, it is reflected in the entidal CO2. So if you keep your ventilation constant, the entidal CO2 indirectly reflects the cardiac output. If the cardiac output of the patient is two liters, the entidal CO2 is roughly about 20 millimeters. And, and this is something very useful when I talk about CPR. Now, normally what happens is the entidal CO2 is measured in concentration, or if you know the atmospheric pressure, you can convert into millimeters of mercury, and normally it is about 36 millimeters of mercury. Since, this, since the capnography waveform is also dependent not only on the perfusion, on the ventilation, when there is an abnormality of the ventilation, it also alters the shape of the capnogram. And this is the classic presentation of a COPD or bronchospasm. And when you give bronchodilators to, to this patient, it reverts back to the normal capnogram. So whenever I intubate someone, if I see this abnormal capnogram, then I know that I have actually produced a little bit of bronchospasm because of the reactive airway disease or patient may be having a COPD or bronchospasm because of asthma. So it gives me an indication right away whether I should treat or not. Now, as I said, the entidal CO2 and the arterial CO2, the normal difference is about four to five millimeters. Therefore, the entidal CO2 is a reflection of the arterial CO2 and the difference generally indicates the alveolar dead space. Now, whenever you look at capnography, you have to look in a very methodical fashion. What is the frequency of the waveforms? That means at the rate. What is the rhythm, whether it is regular or irregular? The height of the capnogram, as I told you, that you know, if your sampling is good, then it reflects this CO2. I mean, it reflects the cardiac output. Then what is the baseline, whether it is coming back to zero and what is the shape of the capnogram? If you look at the capnogram in this fashion, it gives you substantial information in a given clinical scenario. So whenever you apply, when, whenever you do the clinical applications, you have to actually 
look at the values, the entitled CO2 values, whether it is low or high. You can look at the shape. The shape of the capnograms gives you some indication because the shape of the capnogram is specific in certain clinical circumstances. Then, if you know the arterial value, if you have an A line, for example, and you know the PACO2, the difference between these two gives you an idea about alveolar dead space. Now, let's look at some of the clinical applications. The first and the foremost is airway integrity. Now, when you are monitoring CO2 and it suddenly disappears, the first thing, of course, you have to check whether there is a, you, that your monitor is not disconnected and it is working. But the important thing is it could reflect a circuit disconnection. When a circuit disconnection, there is a complete apnea or the patient has stopped breathing because if the patient is spontaneously breathing and you have given a lot of sedatives or narcotics and patient has stopped breathing. So it immediately draws your attention to the patient. Now, confirmation of intubation or misplaced endotracheal tube. When the tube is placed into the esophagus, you do not get the normal CO2 waveform which you, are, which you are expected to see. You may get little bit of blips of CO2 because there is some amount of CO2 is always present in the stomach or particularly when you are ventilating a patient before intubating, you may push some airway from the CO2 from the airways into the stomach. So that is an important, but however, when you do little bit of ventilation or few ventilation, this CO2, uh, I mean, will get washed off and you'll get a straight line. But the point of this is, if you are not, if you are not paying attention to the CO2 waveform after intubation, and your CO2 waveform is flat, always consider that if it could be a failed intubation. Many clinicians who were so confident about their intubation saying that they really put the tube into the, into the trachea, but did not get CO2 because in a state of denial, later on found out that it was an esophageal intubation because patient had a hypoxic cardiac arrest. So, Whenever you get a flat CO2 of intubation requires your attention right away. And this I have already told you, a normal CO2 waveform versus a bronchospasm or a COPD, and that requires your attention whether, whether to treat this patient or not. What about ventilation? Now, as I said, normally the CO2 waveform or, or the entitled to arterial CO2 reflects alveolar dead space. However, when the cardiac output of the patient is changing because of hypotension, hypertension, or, or, or changes in the pulmonary blood flow, the alveolar dead space also changes. Therefore, the entitled to arterial CO2 different, you know, also changes. So in some ICUs, because of the variations in the ventilation perfusion status, the arterial to entitled CO2 will be also changing. And that is the reason why many clinicians think that the using capnography in ICU setting is worthless. But unfortunately, they are wrong. The reason is, if the arterial to entitled CO2 difference is actually is narrowing and is stabilizing over the course of the ICU stay, what does it tell you? It tells you that whatever treatment you are giving to this patient is actually working because it is actually either decreasing the alveolar dead space or it is stabilizing the alveolar dead space. So this has got a very important use in the ICU settings. This is a classic hypoventilation. When someone is hypoventilation, the CO2 height goes up and therefore the entitled CO2 also goes up. And this is the hyperventilation, which you see very often in your clinical practice, because as you continue anesthesia for a while, you're actually decreasing the metabolic, the metabolism of the patients and therefore the CO2 production. And therefore there is a relative hyperventilation to this patient with time, 
and therefore you adjust your ventilation to bring your CO2 back to normal. This is just a sedation capnogram, which we talk a little later too. These are the capnograms before sedation and you see what happens to the capnograms later. There is the respiratory rate has decreased. And here you see the height of the capnogram has decreased because of over sedation. Now, how does cardiac output affect entitled CO2? I'm just repeating this again, because this is very important in our clinical practice that it linearly reflects the entitled CO2 linearly reflects cardiac output. Now, this is the normal, say CO2 is 37 here, and, some, and there is a liver, there is an abdominal surgery or the liver resection is going on, and there is a substantial loss suddenly. And because of this, say, the cardiac output decreases and entitled CO2 decreases. So whenever entitled CO2 decreases for a given ventilation, I mean, dramatically, you must look at the other side of the drapes to see if there is substantial blood loss. So this does help because, as I said, the entitled CO2 reflects cardiac output. And when, if you do not do any corrective measures, if you do not resuscitate such a patient, the cardiac output keeps decreasing, the entitled CO2 keeps decreasing, and finally, there is a cardiac arrest and you begin to revive the patient. And as the cardiac output goes, increases, you see how the entitled CO2 uh, increases. You know, next time, whenever you happen to have a bad case, and then you get into a situation like this, you can see the trend of CO2 to reflect uh, what happened to this patient in the prior to, uh, you know, before the cardiac arrest and after, uh, after cardiac arrest. Now, what about air embolism? And if, see, if you're doing a neurosurgery case and the entitles are pretty good at 36, and then suddenly the entitle decreases. This could be because of air embolism, particularly if you're doing a craniotomy, because what happens is when the air gets sucked in from the sinuses, from the venous sinuses, and then produces an air lock in the pulmonary artery, therefore decreases the pulmonary blood flow, therefore decreases the cardiac output, therefore decreases the entitled CO2. So this, although echocardiography is the most sensitive to detect air, you know, during air embolism, nonetheless, entitled CO2 is number two in the list. What about thromboembolism? You will be doing cases with, you know, hip replacement for, or hip replacement or fracture uh, of, the, of the femur. And, we are, and they are prone to a lot of thrombosis. And when suddenly the entitled CO2 decreases, you can see that probably the patient could have developed thromboembolism. This actually reminds me of a situation that happened almost like about 15, 16 years ago. I gave this lecture to residents uh, on, I think on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday morning, the resident was doing uh, a hip surgery and suddenly the entitled CO2 actually decreased and immediately he called for help. And one of the differential diagnoses he remembered was the thromboembolism. And they did a transesophageal echo and they found the patient has a large clot in the pulmonary artery. And the patient, instead of getting the hip surgery, got a cardiac surgery, went on to the bypass, they did the embolectomy and the patient subsequently had hip surgery two weeks following the cardiac surgery. Now, when you have a patient on the ventilator or even during anesthesia and the patient is recovering, you can see some spontaneous breaths along with the ventilatory breaths. When the height of the spontaneous breaths is same as the ventilatory breath, what does it tell us? It tells us that the patient's respiratory effort is more or less equal to your ventilatory breath and therefore probably ready for extubation. What happens in pediatrics when you actually measure capnograms or when you, when you use capnography? The waveforms you get in the pediatric capnograms are, could vary. All these shapes are normal in children. The reason for that is the capnographs we use, the response time of the capnographs we use is 
longer to measure CO2 very quickly when the, when the tidal volumes are small and the respiratory rates are more in children and the infants. However, the new technology of CO2 monitoring, which is called as a micro stream technology, actually uses 50 ml of sampling flow, but with a greater accuracy and you can get same shape of adult capnogram shapes even in a small neonate with a very small tidal volume. So the current technology is very helpful to get a normal shape of CO2 waveform even in neonates with a very low tidal volume or small tidal volume. However, if you are using a regular monitor, sometimes you can get all these capnograms in children and they are normal. Now, if you're doing aortic surgery, like cross clamping, when you cross clamp during aortic surgery, if the end tidal CO2 decreases greater than 15% from the baseline, or yes, when, when it decreases more than the 15% from the baseline on cross clamping, then when they unclamp, the systolic blood pressure could be greater than 20. What I'm trying to say is, when there is a decrease of entidal CO2 during cross clamping, that shows that the collateral circulation in that patient is not sufficient. And therefore, this patient is likely to have more hypotension when they unclamp. So it actually gives you an indication even before unclamping that I must be prepared with volume and vasopressors because I may expect hypotension on unclamping of iota. Now, what about laparoscopy? Now, it is mandatory to use capnography during laparoscopic surgery. If CO2 monitoring is not used in laparoscopic surgery in the current day or for today, I think it may amount to a criminal negligence on the part of anesthesiologist because, because it is essential to monitor CO2 during laparoscopy because you are, in, you are actually insufflating CO2 into the abdomen during laparoscopy. It helps us to diagnose embolism. It helps us to understand the ventilatory adjustments, whether we need to increase ventilation, otherwise the patient will have met, uh, respiratory acidosis and with low pH. And it also allows us to diagnose complications. In thoracic anesthesia, the best way to figure out where your double lumen tube is placed is using bronchoscopy. Nonetheless, capnography also helps. Now this is a normal CO2 waveform coming from, from the lungs. And suddenly the CO2 waveform changes its shape that tells us that this double lumen tube could have dislodged or obstructed and therefore will allow you to immediately intervene. And when you correct the scenario, you, you get your normal CO2 waveform back. This is just an example of a lung transplant case where CO2 is, uh, where, the, where the CO2 waveforms were recorded. This is a dual waveform. This is the initial part of the lung, you know, the transplanted lung, where the transplanted lung is trying to, you know, slowly get better with the ventilation perfusion mismatch of the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the ventilation perfusion status of the lung. Now, when you are measuring CO2 from a double lumen tube, this is how it looks like in a single lung transplant, because this is the CO2 coming from the old lung, and this is the CO2 waveform coming from this, from the transplanted lung. And when you mix both of them, this is the classic shape of CO2 waveform after one lung transplant. Now, as I said, this is, you monitor CO2 between the anesthesia circuit and the patient circuit. And any of these changes that occur in the patient actually is reflected in the CO2 because you are measuring the CO2 here. It could be an esophageal intubation, 
accidental extubation or disconnection apnea hyperventilation hypoventilation and rebreathing pertaining to the lung it could be reduced cardiac output hypovolemia or hypotension or it could be the co2 production that is decreased or increased when you release tourniquette and or you give sodium bicarb there will be an increase in the co2 and therefore your co2 output could be increased then when there is a pulmonary embolism or cardiac arrest it is reflected in your entitled co2 similarly airway obstruction bronchospasm and respiratory patterns and the dq mismatch is reflected by co2 but as i said and any of these ventilator issues circuit kinking or the ventilator malfunction and that is the reason as i said since it is an indirect monitor you have to look at the co2 waveform here and see what is happening around whether there is a problem in the patient circuit uh, or in the patient uh, or in the problem with the ventilator circuit and if if you understand the physics the physiology and the clinical applications of capnography you can easily figure out what is happening to a patient and you can rectify the hypoxic situation or prevent hypoxia uh, to occur now what about capnography used in the cpr now it is a rescue device in cpr if the patient is dying it actually helps to pull the patient back to life how it is the most reliable method of confirming the correct placement of endotracheal tube because when you are giving a chest compressions and measuring co2 you should get these blips if you are not getting these blips of co2 during chest compressions that means your endotracheal tube is not in the trachea and this is the reason why every patient in the icu where the cardiac arrests are more likely to occur should have capnography because it not only tells you whether the whether the tube is in the trachea but it also confirms to help Uh, it also helps during the resuscitation process of cpr the optimum chest compressions during cpr generates a tidal uh, generates a cardiac output of 2 liters and i showed you that a cardiac output of 2 liters corresponds to about 20 mm so you must always uh, perform chest compressions in order to produce the entitled co2 values between 10 and 20 if your entitled co2 values are consistently less than 10 mm either your chest compressions are not good or if you are giving adequate chest compressions and your entitled co2s are less than 10 then then it is associated with poor outcome so this is the value of capnography in cpr that is why the american heart association in their acls protocol has implemented capnography into their practice and this is the picture as i want you to again remember that the cardiac output is indirectly reflected in co2 measurement and a 2 liter cardiac output corresponds to about 20 mm of co2 now when you are giving chest compressions and suddenly there is an increase in co2 measurement what does it tell you it actually indicates the return of spontaneous circulation that means whatever you did to this patient for resuscitation the patient uh, the spontaneous uh, the, the heart has started spontaneous rhythm and is generating cardiac output which is reflected in your uh, increase in the entitled co2 now this is a very interesting case they act, now actually this patient collapsed in a supermarket so the ambulance comes in and then they do a cpr this ambulance was joined by advanced you know life care cardiac support ambulance which is equipped with capnography and uh, you know uh, etc they intubate this patient and they measured the co2 during cpr they do the cpr for about you know 20 minutes and finally they think of calling off uh, and declaring the patient dead 
However, one of the nurses in the group has substantial experience with capnography. She called the Mayo Clinic uh, emergency room and told them that the entitled CO2 of this patient is consistently over 25 during CPR. What they advised is continue CPR and continue giving uh, shocks. They gave about 13 to 14 shocks and finally the patients had got spontaneous rhythm and the patient was flown to Mayo Clinic and they do an emergency cath and then remove a large plaque and the patient made complete, uh, you know, a very good recovery. And he was actually interviewed in one of the TV channels and where they showed the value of capnography during resuscitation. Although this patient had CPR for 96 minutes, we do not know when to start CPR. And there is some research going on in France to de determine how long one should continue CPR when the, when, when they, when the entitled CO2s are pretty good during chest compression. And also, this also helps as one of the parameters of head cooling after CPR or after cardiac arrest. Now, about almost about five, I should say about six, seven years ago, many societies have introduced capnography to monitor CO2 during moderate to deep sedation. It is more or less mandatory in many countries to monitor CO2 during sedation. Why? The reason is the incidence of hypoxia is less if capnography was used to monitor ventilation during sedation. That is number one. Number two, we do not know how an individual how an individual will respond to a given amount of sedation. Some may respond little more than the others and they can go into apnea. Now, capnography when used in conjunction with the pulse oximetry detected respiratory depression more often than without capnography. And also capnography forewarns of impending hypoxia because capnography can tell you that the patient has hypoventilation or apnea during sedation and immediately you can take steps. If you don't take steps, the patient subsequently becomes hypoxic. And sometimes when you're, because you're giving oxygen to these patients, it actually delays the onset of hypoxia despite apnea. And, and this is where capnography helps us to prevent an upcoming hypoxia in a given patient. And this I have stressed, and many, many clinicians stress now, is administration of supplemental oxygen delays the onset of desaturation following apnea. And therefore, relying on pulse oximetry alone will delay intervention. Now, these are the capnograms that are recorded in sedation. Now, because you are putting an oxygen mask and you are giving uh, oxygen while recording CO2, the shape of the capnograms may not be exactly same as an intubated capnograms. And that is good. You take this as your baseline capnogram before you administer sedation. And any change from the baseline to subsequent capnograms should alert you the effect of sedation. Here you see the respiratory rate is decreased. In this case, you look at the height of the capnogram and look at the height of the capnogram here, and this is decreased. I, this immediately points to whether the hypoventilation or respiratory uh, obstruction because of sedation. The way I use capnography during sedation is I put a nasal cannula, as you can see here, just to monitor CO2. And then I put an oxygen mask to give oxygen. And look at the CO2 waveforms and look at the end tidal oxygen. I'm giving oxygen here, but look at the CO2 waveforms, they're pretty normal in shape. So you can use your ingenuity in any case to get close to perfect CO2 waveforms before administering sedation. And this is a case of endoscopy where I'm monitoring the CO2 here. I made a small hole in the oxygen mask so that they can put the, uh, you know, the endoscope and perform the procedure 
while giving oxygen and also measuring CO2 waveform. And look at the CO2 waveform. They're pretty okay, good size here. So the point I'm trying, now, nowadays actually there are many new masks are available where with a slot for putting the endoscopes while simultaneously measuring CO2 and administering oxygen. Now, I'm going to give you some homework and these are all the capnograms, various shapes. You can actually study each of these capnograms and how you want to do that is you go to Google and put capnography outside the operating room and one of the first papers that comes is an article which I wrote for anesthesiology, capnography outside the operating room. And this is the article here. And when you look at this picture, there's a nice color picture there with all these shapes. And this actually explains each of these capnograms. And please look at this as your homework so that with the background of physics, the physiology and the application, I, uh, I I explained, you should be able to easily understand these various abnormalities of the CO2 wave shock, the, I, mean, I mean, wave form and how they are produced. So now let us go and for a small quiz, there are 11 questions and let us see how you perform and how you understood this capnography. Don't worry, even if you make a mistake, in the end anyway, I will tell you the right answer. So the first one is carbon dioxide absorbs IR light at what wavelength? Three microns, 4.3 microns, 4.3 millimicrons and eight microns. And this is your uh, time. And you get, I think about 20 seconds or 15 seconds. See what you come up with. And then I will, uh, I will uh, I will give you the answer. All right. So thirty seven percent got it right. Four point three millimicrons, and that is the uh, you know that is the answer. And uh, it is not four point three microns. It is four point three millimicrons. So that's good. So we go to the next one now. Phase three capnogram is due to dead space gases. Phase three is the alveolar uh, plateau or mixing of dead space gases with alveolar gases, evolution of CO2 from the alveoli and none of the above. All right, that's good. So, so expired gases from the alveoli, that's very good. So, so this is what I was trying to say that whenever you look at the CO2 waveform, don't simply look at, oh yeah, I see some lines. Look at that phase three, wave, phase three or the alveolar plateau because that actually reflects your ventilation status of the lung. And as soon as actually I enter an operating room, uh, where the case is being uh, you know, performed, I look at the CO2 waveform and immediately that gives me complete clue. Yes, the patient has good cardiac output. The patient has got normal ventilation perfusion status, et cetera, and et cetera. Very good. Arterial to entitled CO2 difference specifically represents anatomical dead space, apparatus dead space, alveolar dead space, none of the above. Wonderful, alveolar dead space, correct. Uh, arterial to entitled CO2 difference indirectly re uh, reflects alveolar dead space. And for those of you who are really interested in volume capnogram, 
you can actually check out the uh, i think on the indian forum myself and one of my fellows wrote an article on volume capnography and uh, nowadays volume capnography is being used to measure bohr's dead space which is the original bohr's dead space not engoff's modification of bohr's dead space but original bohr dead space but that is entirely a different topic but i just wanted to let you know so let's go to the next one now so this is a capnogram occurs in bronchospasm copd significant kinking of the endotracheal tube all of the above correct i think uh, i think you all got it right it is all of the above now bronchospasm yes copd is yes. significant kinking of the endotracheal tube see any obstruction expiratory obstruction leads to that kind of capnogram an endotracheal tube obstruction greater than the 50% of the diameter of the tube can result in abnormal capnogram so so that is the reason i gave this uh, question to very good so we'll go to the next one which one of the capnograms can be seen in the pediatric subjects a only b only c only d only a b c d very good so yes as i said all of these capnograms can occur depending upon the type of the monitor you are using but as i said the new technology well it is not no more new technology the microstream technology has been there for over 20 years now and uh, that technology is a very good infrared technology uh, and uh, it uses less sampling flows it is a side stream monitor and gives you a perfect co2 looking waveforms in a very very small neonates even in the premature babies so the technology is improving and the reason why you get these abnormal co2 waveforms is the response time of the currently available monitors or the adult co2 monitors may not be as good to respond to the co2 changes because of the high respiratory rate and low tidal volume in newborn and uh, and small children but however the technology has improved substantially over the years and you are getting normal looking co2 waveforms in children and newborn next one how is cardiac output related to end tidal co2 linearly inversely no relationship none of the above very good yes it is it is linearly that means as the end, as the cardiac output increases the end tidal co2 increases and the reason i put this question again is it is very very important for you to understand because when i give this capnography lectures uh, at many places some of the uh, delegates come back to me says that you know that was a very good point and they didn't know that end tidal co2 actually reflects cardiac output and this is a very strong uh, relationship between the end tidal co2 and cardiac output and which we can use in our day to day practice we'll go to the next one what happens to end tidal co2 in pneumothorax prolonged phase 2 and 3 no change in end tidal co2 
decrease in entitled CO2, all of the above. This is slightly difficult question, but I put this question because, yeah, first give me your answer. Okay, all right. It is actually all of the above. And as I said, it is going to be a difficult question. I put this question and I wrote about this in, on my website under frequently asked uh, questions. So one day, you know, I get emails from all over the world about capnography. And I got an email from Australia where in one of their fellowship exams, the examiner asked the candidate, what will happen to the CO2 during pneumothorax? And you know, the, 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 uh, the candidate sent me that, the, that question. He says, I was asked about this question and I didn't know exactly what would happen. So I want your opinion. So what happens is the entitled CO2 here can behave, I mean, so when the pneumo, depending on the size of the pneumothorax, it can behave like an obstructive platen because you're compressing the airway so you can get prolonged phase two and three. If the pneumothorax is small, you may have no change. Or if the pneumothorax is actually producing some sort of a compression effect like a tamponade, like where the cardiac output decreases, then it produces a decrease in entitled CO2. So therefore it is anything can happen in a pneumothorax depending upon the status of pneumothorax. And that is the answer it should be, it should be. So that is the why I wrote this question in the, on, on the website too. So let's go to the next one. Does entitled CO2 predict arterial CO2 during laparoscopic surgery? Yes or no? Okay, so actually you all got it mostly right. It is yes, it can predict. There are several studies where it showed that the entitled CO2 predicts arterial CO2 during laparoscopic surgery. Now, if the patient has got a substantial ventilation perfusion mismatch prior to laparoscopic surgery because of either lung problem or the cardiac problem, then it may not reflect. But those are exceptional, you know, uh, ASC status three or four, where you may have to have an arterial line to monitor the PACO2 during laparoscopic surgery. But in majority of the times, the answer is yes, it can predict. Let's go to the next one. Does entitled CO2 predict PACO2 during LMA in anesthesia? LMA is laryngeal mask airway. Yes, very good. So, so yes, it, it, it does predict. And uh, actually the difference more or less is same what you, what you have in an endotracheal uh, tube. That means the arterial to entitled CO2 difference. Now I got an interesting uh, question once from um, one of the states, New Mexico in the United States, where they use combi tube, you know, when the when the emergency ambulance uh, personnel go uh, outside, you know, to get the patients, they put a combi tube on, you know, on the streets. They asked me, how does entitled CO2 reflects the arterial CO2 during combi tube? Well, I told them, I have no idea. 
because I never used CombiTube so far in my life. Uh, touch wood that I don't have to use. But I suppose, you know, if your ventilation is good, it, it could reflect fairly well. But I don't know the answer for that, for the combi tube. Let's go to the next. What should be entitled CO2 during good chest compressions, during NCPR? Entitled CO2 less than 10 millimeters, entitled CO2 between 10 and 20, entitled CO2 has no value in CPR, return of spontaneous circulation has no impact on entitled CO2. Perfect. Correct. The entitled CO2 should be between 10 and 20. As I said, a good chest compression produces a cardiac output of two liters and two liters is reflected by about roughly 20 millimeters on the entitled CO2 for a normal ventilation. And therefore, uh, therefore it, is, uh, it should be used. It should be around that. And monitoring CO2 during chest compressions will actually improve our, our efficacy of chest compressions. If you are not getting good quality CO2 blips of 10 to 20, that means you can tell the, uh, whoever is giving the chest compression that you have to press a little more in order to generate uh, the cardiac output. Let's look at the next one if we have. Yes, we are on the last one. Capnography and sedation. Capnography has no value during sedation. Entitled CO2 value of 40 millimeters should be present all the time. A change in entitled CO2 value or shape from pre-sedation is important during sedation and none of the above. Perfect. A change in entitled CO2 value or shape from pre-sedation is important. That is mean, yes, that is absolutely correct. As I said, because you are measuring this from a mask or a, from a device and there is a dilution by the air or oxygen you're giving and therefore uh, the shape may be a little different, the value may be a little lower, but what is more important is a change when you start your sedation. 